So welcome back, everybody. Is everybody all energized after lunch and an individual session? Yeah. Woo -hoo -hoo! Excellent. Yeah, right, right. Okay. So, uh, sorry, minor confusion. It's easy to confuse me at the moment. I'm going to admit to something now. Ravi knows this. Uh, this time yesterday, actually, I was still on an airplane. I flew in from Holland yesterday. So if I seem a little tired this afternoon, it's because I am. OK. So, <laughs> so when I pretend to be an ops person. It's not or, because you're getting too much positive feelings here. <laughs> could never be because I'm getting too much positivity. But what I would like to do, and very seriously, we had many of my faculty colleagues are hosting workshops for you all. Um, and they're volunteering their time. Um, and I will tell you, I know how busy they all are. They're incredibly busy people. And uh, positive business is such an important part of our school that they were more than willing to give of their time. So uh, on behalf of all of us, I'd really like to thank them all. So I'm going to give them a round of applause. So uh, let's now return to our practice perspective. I mean, you've, you've sat in on the faculty workshops and uh, you know, hopefully uh, listened to the academic perspective uh, on, on positive practices. Uh, <clears throat> what we want to do, I mean, in the morning sessions, you, you heard a lot about purpose. But what we really want to show in this next session is what do today's employees, the so-called millennials, what are they seeking from business? Right? To answer this question, what we have done is we've assembled a distinguished set of panelists. We have, uh, <clears throat> right from the uh, center, Paloma. Uh, Paloma Lopez is the Global Sustainability Director at the Kellogg Cereal Company. Then we have uh, Gina sitting here. Uh, Gina is the president and CEO of a company called Transition to Green. And then uh, on, on my far left is Susan Hunt Stevens. She is founder and CEO of Vspire. Uh, so they will be our three panelists. And we have Rebecca Rosen, senior editor of The Atlantic, who will facilitate the panel discussion. The floor is yours, ladies. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you to the Ross School of Business for having us. Um, we're going to use this time to talk about uh, how companies can leverage the values of their talent and their talent to uh, make a positive impact on the world. Um, we hear a lot about millennials from the media. Um, they're this kind of much discussed, much uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm about them, but there's also some uh, criticism of them. Um, and we have a kind of fuzzy idea of what they, what they value and who they are. But what we do know is that they're a large and growing uh, part of the workforce. They're now the plurality of the workforce, and in just a few years, they're going to be the majority. So I want to start by talking to Susan, um, and we're going to hear from Susan a little bit about what the data says about who these millennials are and what they value. So. Great. Well, it's wonderful to be here today. Thank you so much for having me. Just to give you a real quick snippet of what Weespire does, we work with large corporations to run a design run and measure the impact of their employee engagement programs that are focused on positive business. <laughs> and so um, our companies collectively have about a million employees around the world um, that are participating in everything from sustainability to social impact to well-being type programs. And we run a survey every year, um, not only amongst our, our customers, but actually across um, employees worldwide to look at the state of engagement um, and how companies are trying to engage their employees in positive business initiatives. And what's been striking is to see the differences that have come back in these surveys generationally. And um, speaking as a hardcore Gen Xer, it's a little depressing sometimes to see what my own cohort is saying matters relative to the millennials. And I do um, ha often walk in and, and to companies who are a little like, but the millennials are really clamoring to get involved and get active. And what could I do? And we don't know what to do about it. And I say, thank God for them. You know, they are not giving up like many of us who went into the workforce with uh, values that um, wanted to make a difference, make a positive impact, and then sort of conform to a different way of thinking. I I think that's the biggest thing that has shifted, is the millennials are not conforming. Um, so I, I'm just going to give you some of the statistics. Um, so first of all, just in general around engagement, 60% of employees uh, want their employer to change their stance around engaging employees in positive impact. 
but 76% of those who are under 30 do, relative to only around 50% of those who are over 40. So 20 percentage point plus difference between the generations just on that topic. Um, in terms of uh, interest in being involved more in sustainability, well-being, and CSR, 70% of employees under 30 want to be more involved in these company initiatives, which is great for people like Paloma who are wanting employees to get involved. Uh, the, the depressing part is only about 45% of those over 40 want to be more involved, and so less than half. And so again, a major generational difference. Um, and in terms of wanting to know, this was actually a closer gap, but in terms of wanting to know what their company is doing around sustainability, it was 70% of those under 30 and 60% of those over 40. Um, so that one was closer in terms of caring about what employers are doing. But I think the other thing that's fascinating is um, the role of money. And we are at a business school. I have an MBA from a school in New Hampshire. And uh, I think many people think that the financials and the incentives that are involved change the behaviors and the attitudes. But in fact, um, Net Impact does some really interesting research. And it's been found that um, millennials, for example, um, 60% say they'd rather make $40,000 a year and have a job with impact than make $100,000 a year for one that doesn't. Um, and 60% would take a 15% pay cut to work for a company that aligns with their values. So the millennials do have different attitudes. Um, they aren't conforming as much uh, as previous generations had. And I think that's putting a really exciting uh, demand, frankly, for companies to respond. And then there's this piece that Plomo will talk about that I'm equally excited about, which is the sense of this aspirational consumer. And this is why there's hope for those of us who are boomers and gen Xers. So the truth is, we do care, we do have attitudes and behaviors. And what we're finding is there's actually this cohort called the aspirationals. And those are people who think like millennials when they are making purchase decisions. And it's showing up in the consumer research, um, and it does show up in some of the employee research, especially among women. Mm -hmm. Um, I think one of the things we're seeing is that in perhaps in the pre earlier generation, people who were so values driven might have looked to nonprofit work for their careers. And now we're seeing millennials looking in the business world as a place where they can live their values. Uh, Gina, you teach business. Can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing in your students and what how they're thinking about their careers? Sure. Um, first, I just want to say I must be an outlier because I'm a baby boomer and I'm uh, totally uh, idealistic and never left those values of uh, that I grew up with. And so now, as a way of giving back, I'm a professor at several universities and also run the Institute for Sustainable Enterprise at Fairleigh Dickinson University. And um, one of the classes that I teach is in Bard's MBA in Sustainability. So all the students come there because they're interested in sustainability. And I teach HR and employees and organizations. And it's very interesting to see the diversity of their careers that they're entering. Um, and so I'll just name a few examples. So one kind of career is working for a company that is totally committed to sustainability already in any function, such as I have someone who's in sales at Tesla, and he's crazy about the company Tesla. Uh, also Unilever, I have somebody who was in R&D developing products um, at Unilever. The second category are people that head up sustainability at a major corporation. So for example, I have someone who is now heading it up at Pratt & Whitney in a traditional company. Also, a number of the students are going into nonprofits, such as helping, one of them just got a job, landed a job at Carbon Disclosure Project, working with the oil industry uh, to try to help it. So you could see they're gonna, weaving their way into all different fields. A lot of them go into entrepreneurial careers. Um, I have one student who is building um, food and agriculture in Brooklyn on a rooftop using hydroponics, which is really cool, and it's really very successful. And the last category is um, someone I have who's working now at Etsy, and what she's committed to do is to scale up uh, these kinds of innovations mm -hmm. and uh, scope, scale them up. Great. And Paloma, can you talk about, from your perspective at a major corporation, what the impact of millennials is having on the internal corporate policies and how you guys interact with the world? Sure. Um, what we do know is that um, about 50% of the workforce will be um, millennials by 2020. And I think there's a statistic by PDL, you see that it's 75% by 2025. Um, so we do know that 
responding to this need of, of having a greater purpose and, and truly delivering on it is going to be critical to the, the company's growth. Um, so what we've, doing, what we've been doing as a company um, is um, not just initiatives, but actually we've done something that, that we did for the first time last year, which was to create a strategy just, just about purpose. Uh, it's called our heart and soul strategy. And essentially, it's the backbone of our growth strategy as a company. And I think the message here is that if, if a company is truly serious about embedding purpose into everything they do, it's got to be in their strategy. And it's got to be linked to how they're going to grow, because a business is a business, right? Now, at Kellogg, we say that Kellogg is more than a business. And this is where the heart and soul strategy comes in. Because the heart and soul strategy brings to life our purpose and who we are, which is essentially nourishing um, families so they can flourish and thrive. Um, and under this strategy, we essentially um, talk about how we nourish with our food, how we support farmers' livelihoods, um, and how we uh, nourish the planet and how we live our founders' values. And there's a number of programs that sit under that. So I think to the point of what we're hearing, how, how is a company like Kellogg uh, applying what we see being very, very important and critical uh, is what we've embedded into our strategy. And now everyone within our business has to deliver it on it because that's who we are. Um, and we've heard from our CEO that you know, we need to deliver on that heart and soul strategy, otherwise we will not drive the growth. It's very, very important. So um, exciting from, from our point of view that we've actually embraced these learnings. We are embedding it into strategy. And we've got now programs that I will speak to. Um, but you know, one of our programs, global programs, is Breakfast for Better Days, uh, which is a hunger relief program. And we, get, we have a number of initiatives where we engage our employees. I will speak to that. And then the other one is our Kellogg's Origins program, which is around the people and the places where our ingredients grow. Um, and really supporting both uh, the natural places and, and those people, so thriving farms and farmers. And we're getting more and more employees engaged in experiencing what that looks like. Um, and that's important not only because it drives purpose and it shows that um, as a company we're more than a business and we're trying to create a bigger impact, but it also enables us to have employees answer for their own, with their own experience the questions that they are asking about where are our foods coming from, um, who are the people who grow our foods, and, and, and knowing that there's enough food for everyone and that Kellogg is part of that solution of what we see is a huge run into the future, which is feeding three more billion people. Yeah. And it's really interesting. We've seen um, across our customer base an increasing array of research um, that really builds off of one of the presentations this morning about the business impact of engaging employees mm -hmm. in these programs. When we first started running it, the value proposition to the company was their ability to save energy, waste, water, fuel, hit their environmental targets, brand reputation around those commitments, and things like that. But what happened is they started embedding questions around these programs into their annual employee engagement surveys that Gallup or Workplace Dynamics or others do. And what they started seeing was a positive mm -hmm. correlation, um, and in some cases even causation, between two things. First is the employees that participated in sustainability programs, volunteering programs, and other positive impact programs um, were twice as likely to be highly engaged employees. Mm -hmm. um, and those who hadn't been engaged, who had started as much, who had started in those programs, became more engaged. And then we've had several customers who have also been able to prove a link out to customer loyalty, that those um, companies who are engaging employees in these programs not only have more engaged um, customers, but they're seeing, I mean, uh, employees, they're seeing it in their customers. And so, for example, we have a customer who, um, as employees are participating in these programs and, and having a positive impact, they um, get to change the color of their name batch, um, almost like they have a black belt in sustainability. And customers ask about it. And it starts this dialogue about what the company is doing that ends up having an impact on loyalty. And so as there's more and more data coming out to show the business impact of engaging employees mm -hmm. in purpose and positive impact programs, it becomes almost a, a, a no-brainer to invest in, in these initiatives. Yep. Gina, that's something you've really written about and studied a lot, which is the way that sustainability can be uh, infused into HR values and talent management, talent recruitment. Can you talk about why, what the role of sustainability um, is in that process? Absolutely. So um, 
For me, it's all about living in the paradox. Uh, I heard a wonderful quote the other day that things are getting worse and worse and better and better, faster and faster. So people tend to think that sustainability is really only about or primarily about the environment, but for me, it's all about the people. It's the people, the talent that's going to make it happen, that are going to lead the conversations, that are going to create the vision, that are going to really help us meet our most intractable goals. And I love the sustainable development goals. I'm doing some work with a number of corporations on metrics and measurements in a round table, and virtually all of the companies are already looking at how they can embed sustainable development goals into their business strategies. So sustainability for me is the triple bottom line. It's the integrated bottom line. It's about integrating all of those social, environmental, and economic factors for both the short and long term. We need to think really long term. We need to think in terms of 2050. And many of the best companies are doing that, that right now. Sustainability, I believe, is the defining challenge of humanity and of today. I have no doubt about that. I trust the scientists. I've heard thousands of them, the original ones doing the research, in terms of climate change, global warming, biodiversity, et cetera, income inequality, feeding and providing energy for the, pe the 9 billion people that are going to inhabit the Earth. And at the same time, while that's daunting and challenging, I believe that we absolutely can and must address these issues and unleash the talent. And at the same time, by doing that, we solve this incredible employee engagement gap. It's like a no-brainer. Mm. It's like obvious. That's the answer. Engage everyone in solving these problems. And there's so much technology, innovation. I am mind blown by all the great examples. Um, one of the things that I'm doing in my class is called Aim to Flourish. It was a brainstorm that happened at the um, Global Forum uh, a year and a half ago. And professors and students all over the world are now looking for examples of innovations that are going to help us solve the 17 sustainable development goals, and we're finding them. There are thousands and thousands of untold stories, and we're putting them all into action. And in the process, students are learning how to uh, enroll people, how to use appreciative inquiry, how to use other OD techniques to actually uh, bring about the positive, positive, positive. So using positive techniques and tying it to sustainable development goals, I believe we are on track, but we need to step it up. We need to step it up a lot. I um, probably went off a little too much. <laughs> I can make, actually, I can give an example. Um, at Kellogg, we, we were at the forefront of embracing the new sustainable development goals by the United Nations. Um, there are 17 of them. Um, and they, they really touch on the most important challenges the world is facing, from an environmental to a social point of view. Um, and we've used that frame of reference for everything we're doing now in sustainability. Um, and we have selected a few where we believe that as a company we can make real impact. So I think it's very important when it comes to purpose, you know, it's very important to stay focused as well. Um, so it's not about anything you do works. Every company has a purpose and an opportunity to drive real impact. So for example, at Kellogg, um, sustainable development goal number two, uh, which is uh, hunger relief. We're really big on that because we're a food company. We're a grains company. <laughs> um, and so we've got the right foods to feed a lot of people with less resources. Um, we are also really big on sustainable development goal number five, which is on women and gender mm -hmm. e equality. Um, we have a lot of programs. It's one of our big commitment on sustainability is on women. Um, but it goes all the way from farms to how we work with suppliers to our diversity and inclusion agenda uh, within the company. So everything we do needs to leave those values and that commitment. Um, uh, we're also really big on sustainable development goal number 12, uh, which is in uh, sustainable uh, consumption. And actually, our CEO um, has um, voluntarily signed up to be one of the champions for uh, an initiative on food loss and food waste. I'm very proud of that and also caring for climate. So one of the things is in sustainability, it's very, very important that we all come together. So to create, to deliver impact on purpose, there needs to be collaboration, there needs to be focus, and there needs to be a, 
a recognition that when there are good frameworks, we should all work under those frameworks because then we can create more. Um, and then the other piece is, you know, when we're looking at purpose, look at how companies and specifically their leaders are taking a stand or not mm -hmm. in being leaders. Um, I feel very proud to be in a company where in the last you know, couple of years I've seen our CEO and all of our leaders being very involved and made very broad, very bold commitments on um, climate change and climate smart culture. So um, I think it's a really important component is um, it's, it's, it's about recognizing that, especially depending on the size of the business, uh, but for big companies, that you have to play in the big league mm -hmm. and you have to play big, but you need to stay focused. So thank you for bringing that up because we often right. forget that we have really good frameworks in the world that we can all come together and collaborate and create real change. But sometimes, you know, they don't come across, we want to do our own little thing, but that's mm -hmm. not how sustainability works and that's not how impact works and that's not how real purpose really works. I think the other thing that it's easy to gloss over, this all sounds so rational and fabulous, why isn't everybody doing it? It's really hard. I don't know how many of you in the audience have ever had a job where you needed to engage people, you know, and to be, bring their whole self to work every day, 250 to 365 days a year, depending on what you're doing. Um, but there's a reason that um, only 30% of at least the U.S. workforce is engaged at work. Think about how pathetic that number is, only 30%, which means 70% aren't, which is about a $500 billion problem that corporations face. And that's because engaging people in general is really, really hard. Then you throw on engaging them in programs that in some organizations are seen as nice-to-haves, not needs-to-haves or are seen as complicated. I cannot tell you the look that most employees' faces get when you start talking about kilowatt hours or carbon emissions or things like that. It just, literally, you have to meet people where they are. And I think one of the things that's really hard um, that we, when we go in and start working with organizations, have to do is to remind leadership, particularly sustainability and CSR leadership, to meet people where they are, which is where sustainability and CSR leadership probably was five to 10 years ago mm -hmm. in terms of understanding the journey. And to recognize that every employee is on a journey, but for some, when we do a focus group with employees and ask them where energy comes from, the plug on the wall is the most common answer to that question. There's no sense of grid, there's no sense of power plant, there's no sense that it's you know, a natural gas burning or coal burning or what renewable would be and things like that. And so dialing ourselves back has to be one of the most important things to do because if you make it too complicated, if you make it too scientific, in, in I'm not saying to dumb it down, I'm just saying to explain it uh, clearly, then people aren't, um, aren't going to figure out how to engage. And I think that's one of the first things I hear from a lot of people is, I really want to do something, just tell me what to do, because I don't know what it is. I, I love that point, and I wanted to um, pick up on it, because I think one of the biggest challenges we have is mainstreaming sustainability into every function. It tends to be siloed in the sustainability department or in, in CSR or whatever, and it needs to be mainstreamed in every function. And uh, one of our clients, uh, Wyndham Worldwide, which is one of the case studies in my book, what they decided to do is to mainstream it in every function, and over a year we did 18 lunch and learns focused specifically on what does sustainability have to do with me. We did it for IT, we did it for facilities, we did it for finance, we did it for HR, we did it for marketing. And even though every one of the companies, every one of the departments and the whole company is very committed to sustainability, when people came into the first session, they really had no idea how to apply it. So we did it in three pieces over three months, just a lunch and learn, explaining what do we mean by sustainability. The second one was like, what, what does this have to do with me? And by the third one, they actually came out with action plans they had developed, and then they tracked the implementation. So it was very simple, it wasn't expensive, and it really helped people understand it. But to expect a one-size-fits-all, because what a nuclear engineer might need to know about sustainability is very different than what maybe a marketing or HR person really cares about. Yeah, and, and I, I would just build that um, society is, can be very complex uh, because it can go very technical. But that's where, again, it's so important that at a company level you have a real purpose and that it's easy to add up the initiatives. So 
not, not to get too caught up on the details of the technicalities, but hey, we're here to feed more people. Ultimately, what does that mean? Is that you know, depending on where you are in the business, you're going to be able to you know, either help with using less resources, which then means that maybe those resources go into growing more food. Um, so we have to have a, a single purpose, but then things need to kind of feed into it, and we need to make it simple. Um, we at Kellogg are one of our big initiatives, and we have been asked to really lead in this space of sustainability. So we are like full speed right now. Um, but one of the things that we're doing to make this happen um, you know, is to really integrate it into the business. So one of, of the things that is on my plate and the rest of uh, the Kellogg Society team's plate is we all have a responsibility to drive capability building. So help people understand, bring it down, and, and help them kind of embrace that we've got a purpose and together we're gonna achieve something really big. Um, it's, it's a really big part of my, of my workload. <laughs> it's actually dedicating time to people within the organization to enable them to understand and to grasp it and to make it their own. Because, right, sustainability is an enabler. It shouldn't be driving the, calling the shots. It should be enabling others to realize their purpose as part of employees of the organization. Exactly. And it's interesting, um, the phrase we use is changing the lenses in people's glasses mm -hmm. on how they see the world. And so they see um, not only their company in a new way, but how they can um, uh, add impact. And in the process of adding impact towards those goals, create a real sense of purpose and meaning for themselves. Because I think that's one of the most powerful things that we see, and this gets back to, you know, when people realize they're having an impact through their job, mm -hmm. whether that's as a housekeeper or whether that's as a purchasing agent, or whether that's as somebody who works with the farms, but if they realize that they're having an opportunity to make the world a better place through their job, um, they are twice as likely to be one of your top performers. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. there is a way for everyone in an organization to have an impact, but getting them from where they don't see that connection to where everybody understands that connection is a journey, and it takes a lot of time, and it's not easy, and um, companies need, need a lot of help in this area. Um, Paloma, can you go back? You were saying before about the two big global programs that come out of Kellogg's uh, Heart and Soul Strategy. Can you talk about what those programs say about all the themes that we're, we've been discussing? Sure. Um, so the first one of those programs, which has been running for a number of years now, it's our Breakfast for Better Days program, which is a global initiative. And since 2013, which is our, the last goal setting we had, we um, um, our goal was to provide one billion servings of food to people in need. Um, and you know, in places like the US, it's not about food scarcity. It's really more about people not having access to that food. So um, as a company, that's, that's one of our big initiatives. And the way we actually work and make it happen is we work with, we've created and in partnership with schools and organizations Breakfast clubs, we, we uh, support breakfast clubs all across the United States and across the world. Um, and we also uh, support a number of food banks. We partner with retailers to do even bigger initiatives. So this is all about the power of collaboration. Um, and one of the things, you know, as it relates to how we engage employees, which uh, I think it's a, a great initiative within Kellogg, is every first, every first Friday of the month, one of our leaders takes his or her entire team to volunteer at a food bank. And that is powerful, because mm -hmm. talk about taking a, a whole day to do something that is beyond business. It's really about, hey, we work for a company, we work for a company that has a bigger purpose, and, and we're gonna dedicate time so you can experience it firsthand. So that's one of the many things we do. We do uh, what we call, um, um, speak vol speed volunteering on Fridays. We fill backpacks for kids so they can have kids in need, so they can have food over the next week. And we do a, a number of many initiatives. We have 2,000. We have 30,000 employees worldwide, of which about 2,000 are in our Battle Creek, our headquarters here in Michigan. Um, and about 1,500 of those, so 1,500, have actually volunteered. This is awesome because they've been part of this program and they know what it's like. The other initiative, um, and again, this links to what we talked about, which is sustainable development goal number two on hunger relief. So let's, let's connect the dots. So Kellogg is, is, is committed to that. Not only that, but from a sustainability point of view, we're also very committed to reducing food waste and reducing food loss, mm -hmm. which also is another approach to hunger relief. 
So uh, very committed in that space, linked to bigger frameworks, uh, enables through a program, uh, and, and with the support of our leaders to engage as many as, you know, almost 80, 90% of our employee base. So the other program that we have is I call our Kellogg's Origins program. And Kellogg's Origins is about the people and the places behind our ingredients. It truly is about thriving farms and farmers. And we um, essentially have, over the last year, I mentioned that we're in a like, fast speed right now, um, but we've doubled the amount of projects on the grounds with, with farmers. We also have an ambassador program which we launched in Europe and we hope we'll have more opportunities to roll out, roll out in other regions, which essentially we send employees to the farms and then they spend time with the farmers, they spend time learning about sustainable agriculture and they come back and they share with the rest of the office their experience and they write articles. And it's a really nice way of staying connected with the food and also um, for them to see that we go all the way back to the farms and that our work there is meaningful. It's helping us with our objective of helping supporting farmers' livelihoods. Uh, but also, as a company, we've, um, we have our 2020 sustainability commitments and we've also made additional commitments, and one of which we sits under this program, the, the Kellogg's Origins program, is we've committed to support 500,000 farmers to adapt climate smart agriculture. Talk about getting sophisticated. So climate smart agriculture is about what we see is coming into the future on climate change and the opportunity that farmers have to prepare way in advance to be better prepared so they can also be in a better position to feed their families. Talk about the US, but talk about other regions of the world where we as a com global company also operate. How important that is. So we've made that commitment. We have our employees traveling when we can, and some occasions bringing the farmers into the offices as well to relate the experiences. So these are the big two initiative programs that we have right now. We, we have a number of other initiatives. Um, so for example, one of the other things that we do as a company is um, everything we do needs to also transpire through the power of our brands. So Morningstar Farms is one of Kellogg's brands. And uh, the brand is um, committed to good for you, good for the planet. And over the last um, year, we've been working on a life cycle assessment. And they're really on a journey of helping address behavior change and helping more people live a, you know, a healthy lifestyle, making choices on how they eat and how helping them understand and grasp, as we were saying, make it tangible and easy. So very exciting, but I just wanted to mention that beyond what we do at a corporate level, the brands need to take a stand. And it's so refreshing mm -hmm. when we see brands, you know, other brands, you know, we know many examples of and good brands. And, and we also are seen in our business with Morningstar Farms in Europe, Special K is partner with a big initiative called Time for Change. They've, they've impacted 25,000 women, rich one million women to drive awareness. So very exciting, but it's another component is it's not just the, com the company, the brands also need to demonstrate that they're on that journey as well. And I want to build on a couple of things that she said that I've seen as well, which is I think um, sometimes people think of volunteering programs as just things to be uh, a good neighbor or to donate the mm -hmm. value of your employees' time mm -hmm. to the community. When done in alignment with a purpose and a mission and a strategy, mm -hmm. one of the most powerful things about volunteering is it becomes a great source of innovation and where employees get ideas on things and a way of looking at their role very differently. It also becomes a really big source of relationship building uh, mm -hmm. within the company and strengthens the relationships with employees, which is a key driver of mm -hmm. engagement. And the other thing that I would add is, um, is we work with a number of consumer-facing brands, and they are seeing that when they're embedding that sense of purpose at the brand level, that um, the, in, in one case, the brands that have a, a purpose input into it are growing 3x faster than those brands that don't have a tie to purpose. And so you know, if, you, if you are in a company that has multiple brands, trying to really figure out what is not only the purpose of our company more broadly to have a positive impact, but how does this brand contribute in a special way? Um, and employees can really help to ideate and create on, on some of those. Um, and the results from a business standpoint when executed um, well in that strategy are really, really impressive. I mean, it's still relatively early days on the proof points of that, mm -hmm. but consumers are responding, um, which is great. Uh, the last thing that I would add that I think, um, so. I would love every single executive in every single one of our companies to have a financial 
uh, incentive tied to hitting their sustainability and purpose goals. Um, it does make a difference and it does work. But one thing is really interesting about this recognition aspect, and that is 35% um, of employees say they would rather get an email from their manager recognizing something they had done than a $2,000 bonus. Hmm. Think about that. 35% would rather get an email than a $2,000 bonus. Um, there is enormous power in recognition, mm -hmm. enormous power, and it is something we do not do enough for people in general. I have been tweeting the sugar cubes all day because I think <laughs> those are awesome, and like every company should have a sugar cube wall. And we do have a, a technology version of that called Kudos um, that we run. But there is something about giving the ability not only for employees to get positive feedback from leadership about the things they're doing mm -hmm. to drive positive business, but to give it to each other. And when an employee um, gives positive feedback to another employee who volunteered or who came up with a great idea for a way to do more uh, reduced waste in packaging or things like that, guess what that employee does? And we have data that shows this um, that got that positive feedback. They go do something else that's positive, and they encourage others to do that. And there's this network effect of positivity that takes place in the workplace when you combine education and awareness building with inspiring people to take action, with an ability to then give positive feedback and recognition for that action. And it is more powerful than financial incentives, and we've been able to prove that, which is pretty exciting. We, we do at Kellogg something called the um, Planet Heroes. Um, and we, we, we've started selecting people um, in our farms, farmers, who are our planet heroes because they're doing extraordinary things uh, that we recognize are meaningful to our purpose and to the world. Um, and then we also have our uh, food heroes uh, in the making of the food. Um, and then we have those heroes in the offices who sell and distribute our foods. Um, so, and, and it's true, it's so powerful. And, and we haven't really spoken about storytelling, but um, it, the power of recognizing people's contributions um, it's not to be underestimated. And, and the power of telling a good story about somebody who did something extraordinary is not to be underestimated. Gina, I think yeah. you I just wanted to make a couple of comments on a couple of things that were said. Um, there was this incredibly uh, successful um, intervention that is called Caring Capital. And it ties together a lot of what we've just been saying. And uh, what they do is they go into various companies like Novartis and Wyndham and lots of different companies and they bring all the employees together in employee engagement, team building activity to create and make things for charities. And then they give it to the charity. And it, you'd see the most hard-nosed uh, executives who come in like, what is this thing? And they break down in tears when they see the difference that it's making. I just wanted to mention that. To your point about um, what all the different dimensions that this satisfies when we're really working uh, to build that holistic, sustainable uh, environment and culture. I think there are six major human needs that need to be satisfied at work, and I think Jane um, talked about a number of them this morning. So one we were just talking about is rec recognition. So we need to recognize people for doing these things. Respect, that is the most important, treating people with respect and dignity, and that also ties to diversity and inclusion that we were gonna talk about. A sense of belonging, so if we can create uh, interventions and experiences and environments where people sense this feeling of belonging, Autonomy, people need to be given some freedom, so creating green teams, creating, now they're creating ERGs that are for sustainability, we've set them up in many companies, and let the employees just run with the ball, you don't have to tell them what to do, just create that environment. Can you say what ERG stands for? Just for Employee resource groups, like affinity groups, uh, and now they're creating sustainability um, ERGs. Novartis has now hundreds of people, we set it up one year ago, they have hundreds of people on it now, creating all sorts of interventions, ideas, and uh, innovations. The next thing is personal growth. That is the main reason why um, I believe millennials leave. They don't see challenge. They don't have an opportunity for personal growth. And if there's ever an opportunity for personal growth, sustainability is it. And finally, kind of wrapping the whole thing together is meaning and purpose that we've talked about so much here. So if we can find ways to tie together those six human needs uh, for that people have to thrive at work to sustainability, I think that's the key. And I just wanted to say a couple more words about more of the technical aspects of how to do this, which has to do with how HR manages uh, talent management. We have systems, I've been in HR for 30 years, we have systems galore, and sustainability it was only embedded in our performance management systems, 
our recruiting and interview guides, our behaviorally based interview questions, like Jane showed an example of that this morning. Uh, in terms of our succession planning, it should be all of our systems have every goal, every single employee have a goal around sustainability. BASF does this. So I think from the psychology perspective, I was just sharing the six sort of key drivers, but then for also from the tactical perspective, we need to embed it in all of our HR systems. I think we're coming in at the end here. So um, I just want to ask you all just uh, in conclusion, what if you could uh, give our audience one lesson that they would take home with them today, what do you think is the big idea animating your work and animating our conversation that you would hope that they uh, really internalize? We can start maybe with Susan. I think the big idea is um, it is possible to have 100% of your workforce engaged in making your business a force for good in this world. And if you do, you will win as a business. And if you don't, you won't be here. I think it's as simple as that. But engaging 100% of your workforce when, on average, if you're a US corporation, only 30% are engaged today in general, let alone in making your business a force for good in this world, is an enormous challenge. And there's a reason it's the number two topic on business executives' hands. And I think people are the key. And if we put as much focus on having 100% engagement as we do on 100% systems uptime or manufacturing efficiency or all those other metrics, you would see business flourish in a way that would change this world for the better. Paloma? Yeah, I would, I would say um, the importance of embedding purpose into, if we're talking about a company, not a, a nonprofit, a company, into the growth strategy and really making it strategic and critical to that growth strategy. Because otherwise, we're talking about a nice add-on. Mm -hmm. and what we're looking for is a real purpose where everybody's working and rolling in the same direction. And that's, I think, really important. So when it comes to evaluating whether or not companies are committed to purpose, you know, look at how, whether or not it's integrated into their strategy. And then look to see how robust those programs are across the journey of their products or services. Um, that's, you know, and how integrated you know, it is within the business. Because at the end of the day, purpose is not about a team of sustainability or CSR or HR people or champions, you know, people who really want to drive it. This is about everyone coming together and making something big happen. So if it's not integrated, purpose is gonna be not quite there. Mm -hmm. So look, look for those signs of true purpose and then when it comes to bringing it to employees, our experience is make it as experiential as possible, mm -hmm. make it as accessible as possible, um, and make it as meaningful as possible. So fewer things with bigger impact, and focus and focus, and, and keep, keep it down to a few programs, or you know, one or two, but with true purpose and with true impact. Great, thank you. Do I have the last word? Mm -hmm. You have the last word. <laughs> OK, so um, I'll sort of summarize some of the things that we've talked about in terms of what I call uh, tips, transformative impact practices. I actually wrote an article in Social Innovation, Re uh, Stanford Innovation Review. Um, and those are three. One is what I call co-creation. I think we need to co-create uh, how we design products, bringing consumers mm -hmm. and customers into the process. We need to do co-creative planning with communities, thinking mm -hmm. being local, global and local, co-creation. Number two, while leadership is incredibly important, and I didn't, we didn't have a chance yeah, to fully talk to about it. that, bottom up, we need to unleash the talent, the capability, the passion of people, and create those opportunities, and people will come. And third, the long view. I think we're all, running around like lunatics, we're buried in our phones, and we really need to step back, reflect, be mindful, think of the long view, think of 2050. How are we going to create a world that feeds, energizes, and that is as good as the world we came into for our children and grandchildren? Thank you all so much, and thank you to the audience, and thank you to the Ross School of Business for having us. This is great. I'd really like to thank our panel. It was really interesting, so.
So I'm not sure what you heard through the pad, but as I was listening, I started to think the accountant is becoming a believer. I think this stuff may actually work. <laughs> so, but some of the things that kind of came across to me was something I never really thought about before, and I suppose I maybe, I'm, I suspect I'm gonna be in the minority here. When I hear sustainability, I hear about the environment, but it really stuck with me. Sustainability has to be about people. Right? And that was really a powerful message. Um, and it can't just be sustainability because we feel good. Right? It has to be part of what our strategy, our mission, our purpose are. And it, you know, I'm really optimistic about the future because listening to the millennials, they're phenomenal, and we get them here all the time, and we forget how lucky we are because all of our students at this point are millennials, pretty much. And they're just an amazing group of people, and they're just wonderful to engage with. So I really am optimistic about the future, except engaging them is hard, so we're gonna have to think through some really interesting practices. So, and I think as we go through the rest of today and, and through tomorrow, we're gonna start thinking about some practices that may help, we even heard some from our panel, that may help with this sustainability. So thank you again for, you've made it a believer out of the accountant. So I'd now like to invite our next speakers up, uh, Rachel Morton and Alison Swimmer. Uh, they are both from the Center for Positive Organizations, and they're going to introduce us to the Positive Business Project, which is a student-led initiative. Welcome. Hi, I'm Allison. And I'm Rachel. And we're here today to present the Positive Business Project which is a student-led initiative designed to identify and reward companies that practice positive business. That practice positive business. Tomorrow, we will, we will be presenting the grand prize winner of the project at our main stage, stage session. But before we get into those details, we wanted to tell you how we got involved with this initiative. We're both student affiliates at the Center for Positive Organizations, which is a community dedicated to energizing and transforming organizations all around the world. Little did we know that when we got involved with this community, it would completely change our college experiences. I first got involved before I even entered into the business school, and having this knowledge about positive business so early on in my college career made me realize the impact that, po that businesses can make on the society. During another summer program at the center, I worked with an organization to identify and interpret its positive capabilities. Now when I think about the future, I'm confident that I will find an organization that will allow me to have a positive impact on the world. But what we love most about being students at the Center for Positive Organizations is not just learning this research, but it's putting the research into practice and learning about companies that do this on a day-to-day -day basis. So with that being said, we are very excited to be here today to present the Positive Business Project. So what is positive business? At Michigan Ross, it means creating economic value, creating a great workplace, being a great neighbor to the community, and being a great steward to the environment. Organizations who practice positive business advance core business objectives while achieving these other worthwhile goals. They do this by implementing positive practices. Three years ago, the students at the center were interested in identifying companies who achieve both of these goals. And this is where the idea for the Positive Business Project was born. Each year, the Positive Business Project team identifies and rewards exceptional companies who, pack, who practice positive business. And this has allowed us to see how the research at the center is put into practice. This year, we had 26 semifinalists that were chosen based on three criteria the extent to which the practice aligned with positive business, its impact, and its ability to be replicated in other companies. Of the 26 semifinalists, the top five then moved on to the next round as finalists and created videos that highlight their positive practices. You should go see those videos in the lower winter garden once you get a chance. Our team chose a panel of judges to judge this round that consisted of faculty, and student, students and business leaders that were all affiliated with the Center for Positive Organizations. We had Wayne Baker, who was the first faculty director of the center, Roger Newton, 
who was the, the co-discoverer of Lipitor, Rick Haller, who is the former president and COO of Wal Walbridge, which is the company that's working on the construction over at Ross next door. <laughs> and finally, we had two students, Erica Danchik and Kevin Yang. This panel of judges chose the grand prize winner, and we will be announcing them tomorrow at our main stage presentation. So our goal for the project this year was to not only identify and celebrate companies who practice positive business, but to create a tool for attendees like you all to learn from these companies as well. So we created the Positive Business Practice Handbook, which can be viewed on the Center's website. It showcases all 26 organizations and their positive practices. Our hope is that you'll view this handbook and learn from these companies as well. There are a wide range of organizations from all different industries and of different sizes, so any company can learn from this handbook. For example, we have Menlo Innovations, a small tech company in Ann Arbor that is an example of a great workplace. One of the ways that this company practices positive business is by allowing its employees to bring their babies to work. On the other hand, we have Mahindra Finance, a financial services company headquartered in Mumbai that is a great neighbor to the community by helping people in rural India get loans who may not have been able to otherwise. And if those two companies weren't enough to show how this handbook includes a wide range of practices, add Interface to the mix, the world's largest designer and maker of carpet tile. This organization is a great steward to the environment, allowing fishing communities in developing countries to sell back their discarded fishing nets into a global supply chain. So as you can see from only three of the 26 organizations, any company can find a practice in this handbook that they can learn from and find inspiration for their own. Now that we've told you a little bit about the project, we would like to introduce you to our team and share what we have gotten out of this experience. So the Positive Business Project is an annual initiative that's undertaken by the University of Michigan and in coordination with the affiliated Center for Positive Organizations, which is aimed at studying, identifying, and how really disseminating positive business and how rewarding those leaders that are involved in positive business. The project was important to me to not only learn about how organizations implement positive business practices, but to then share these practices with other organizations all around the world. So the purpose of this project was really to showcase these positive practices, really highlight the benefits for both the people and even the bottom line of the organization. And because of this, this has been such a great learning experience that anyone that's exposed to these practices can be convinced to become a positive agent for change. So for me, what I gained from the Positive Business Project is that all of these positive practices are really going on around us in a bunch of different types of organizations. Uh, and all it takes is for us to appreciate, recognize, and support it so that these practices can continue to grow um, and only flourish from here. The Positive Business Project has been important to me because it's given me the opportunity to learn more about positive business and to participate in some really exciting and generative conversations. This initiative has given me hope that I'll really be able to find a workplace that will allow me to thrive. Um, and for me, what I got out of the experience is it's really shown me how easy it is um, to take these positive initiatives and implement them in organizations, that they can be done by people at all levels um, with all backgrounds. So as you can see, our team has gained so much knowledge from this project, and our hope is that you all gain something too. We encourage you to go down to the Lower Winter Garden, and there you can view those five finalist videos, grab an I Am Positive Business pin, and also drop your business card in our raffle to win an exclusive subscription to our Positive Business Project Book Club. In the next session, you'll have a chance to use some of these ideas about positive business into your own. And with that being said, we are very excited to see you tomorrow at our grand prize recognition. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Just goes and sits down. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel and Allison, for uh, showcasing uh, some of the positive business practices. You know, if you haven't really gone downstairs to see some of the videos, I really encourage you to do so. Now, these are obviously from the 26 submissions, filtered down to five, some of the practices. What we're going to do now is really, because I'm sure you have some practices of your own, right? So put on your thinking caps, and we are going to do a giant crowdsourcing experiment. 
right? And so that you can develop some of the few positive business practices of your own. So to do this giant crowdsourcing experiment, I now invite uh, Terry Nelidoff. Terry is the managing director of the Urban Institute, as well as Jonathan Grice, who is the associate director of the Tauber Institute, to introduce the idea to you and conduct the experiment. Terry and John. Good afternoon. I am Terry Nelladov of the Urban Institute for Global Sustainable Enterprise, and today I'm joined by... I'm John Grice, the Associate Director at the Tauber Institute for Global Operations. Let's mix things up a little bit. We just heard all these amazing experiences from the Ross Positive Business Project, and that, that started with dozens of positive practices and then sifted them down to the last five finalists. And stay tuned, tomorrow you're going to hear the grand prize winner, uh, tomorrow. So as Ravi mentioned, I know that there's a, a lot of good ideas here. We have 300 folks in the audience. We have a strong hunch that uh, based on your experience, based on what's in your hearts and your heads, there is lots of ideas floating around. Um, so as Ravi mentioned, we are going to do a real-time crowdsourcing activity. Um, I know that not all of us like to stand up and share, but that's exactly what we'll be doing today. Um, it's going to be high energy and a lot of fun. Tell me how, John. How are we going to do this? All right. Well, I'd be happy to, Terry. Thank you for having me. Um, so we're going to uh, take, the, take the, uh, the opportunity to uh, reach into your name badge, behind your, uh, or into your lanyard behind your, your name badge, and you will pull out and remove a positive business blitz card. It'll be looking just like this one. Uh, please take out a pen if you need one. There are ambassadors in the aisles that can provide both a pen uh, as well as a card to participate. So uh, no one will be left out. Uh, just so you know, everyone will be sharing ideas, so it's important to participate and uh, use your card. So has everybody found the card, and does everybody have access to a pen? Now we're going to invite each of you to take two minutes to think on and write down a positive business practice that has rocked your world. So this can be a positive practice along the lines of what we just heard from the Positive Business Project, or it can be something that addresses bigger picture sustainability issues beyond the firm, things like climate change or water, working conditions in supply chains, or even business and human rights, all the stuff we've been hearing about all day today. So take a couple of minutes now, two minutes, uh, think on and, and write down uh, an idea of a positive business practice that has rocked your world, and please keep the, the idea short, make it complete, and make sure your handwriting is legible to other people because you'll be sharing these cards. All right. And Terry and I will be participating as well. 